I'm Julie Zenner along with Kelsey Roseth, and here are our topics on Almanac North. We'll talk with the new captain of the Duluth Salvation Army about the work they do and the needs of the community. Producer Megan McGarvey brings us a story on taiko drumming from a performance in Superior this week. And Community Action Duluth has an important fundraiser next week to help support their programs that lift people out of poverty. Those stories and Voices of the Region up next on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. And Kelsey Roseth is in for Denny this week. Welcome back, Kelsey. It's good to have you here. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, we hope that uh, you enjoy your time here and that you'll get a chance to do it again. Yeah. But right now, let's begin with the headlines. Thanks, Julie. UMD's Women's Resource and Action Center is hosting the annual Take Back the Night rally next Thursday. Take Back the Night is the oldest worldwide movement to stand against sexual violence. Folks will begin gathering for the rally in March at UMD's Kirby Ballroom at 6 p.m. on October 12th. The Commission on Judicial Selection has recommended three candidates to replace retiring Judge Michael Cuso, who chambers in Cook and Lake Counties. The candidates are Steve Hankey, attorney for the City of Duluth, Molly Hicken, the Cook County attorney, and Tyson Smith, an attorney practicing in Grand Marais. Minnesota Governor Tim Walz will choose one of the three to replace Judge Cuso in the 6th District. Good news if you're traveling by air from Duluth. The local airport has the shortest security wait times in the nation. The organization Planetware collected data from more than 150 U.S. airports and found that the average wait time at the Duluth International was just one minute. The longest average security wait times were in the Honolulu, Hawaii airport. And this may be your last chance to get out and see the peak fall colors in northern Minnesota. The Minnesota DNR's Fall Color Finder shows all areas of northern Minnesota past 50% peak and many at 75% or higher. Much of Itasca and Kuchiching counties are already past peak colors. The Duluth Salvation Army welcomed new captains to town recently. Captains Anthony and Alicia Norden transferred to Duluth from the Army's Fergus Falls, Minnesota branch. Both are graduates of the Salvation Army Training College and met during their work within the Army. Joining us now is Cam Captain Anthony Norden of the Duluth Salvation Army. Welcome. And Thank you. we heard that you welcomed a baby shortly after. Um, <laughs> You, you came into town, so congratulations to you and your wife. Well, thank you so much. I would have joined you sooner if it wasn't for that. <laughs> well, it's fair to take some time for that. <laughs> Absolutely. So, thank you again for being here. My pleasure. Um, now, can you tell us a little bit about your role and what it entails as a captain of the, Ar of the Salvation Army? Oh, absolutely. So, um, as a captain of the Salvation Army, I guess you could really think of it like an executive director position. So, I'm there helping to oversee all the departments and programs with my wife. Um, I, we split the responsibilities as evenly as we can and I take over certain things and she does certain things, but it also involves being a pastor. So we're both the executive director and pastor of the Salvation Army. So we help in those capacities and we also do stuff like this where we get to talk to the community and just talk to, to you guys, fill you in. Mm -hmm. What have you learned about local needs since you arrived in Duluth? I think that is best summed up by when I sat down in Rotary, my first time visiting Rotary, someone asked me, what do you think about the housing crisis here? And my response was, what housing crisis? <laughs> and I quickly found out that Duluth has uh, some housing needs. So Rotary very quickly taught me to look into things. So I think that was one of my first things I noticed was the need for more housing and how the Salvation Army is already helping in that direction with mm -hmm. the 15 units we have and some of the rapid rehousing we do. Mm -hmm. Is it typical for officers to, to move around every four or five years so that they can kind of like bring new experience and, and new insights into a community? Oh, absolutely. So a lot of it's based on people who retire. So someone who has a lot of experience, they say they retire at a larger Salvation Army in a bigger position. You need someone who has experience to, to then take over because it's a big operation. You don't want to take someone fresh out of college and say, here's a big operation, have fun. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't really work. So a lot of times those moves are caused by people who retire. So four to six years is the average, but you know, it could be shorter, it could be longer. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm curious about what it looks like when you get started in a role like this in a new community. Um, you mentioned Rotary is, yep. was a great place where you could learn about the community's needs. Where else do you go to learn that critical information? Um, our advisory board actually. So the Salvation Army has an advisory board here in Duluth and it's something we're looking to grow. But our advisory board members are, are wonderful resources because they stay in between Salvation Army officers 
and they can and they're community leaders, business leaders, so they have a direct connection. They know what the Salvation Army is doing. They know what's their businesses and the connections they have. So that's a quick way to learn what's going on. I love getting to visit uh, service clubs. I've been to Kiwanis. I just rejoined Rotary here. Well, I just rejoined the Rotary uh, here in Duluth with Duluth 25. I left the Fergus Falls one. So being in those service club organizations, um, getting invited to other groups, I, I really enjoy getting to speak with uh, other clubs, um, whether it's Optimists, Alliance, they really fill me in on what's going on. And I'm able to respond at the Salvation Army by saying, okay, someone is telling me what's going on and catching me up to speed. Mm -hmm. Now we mentioned in the introduction that your wife is also a captain mm -hmm. in the Salvation Army. Is that, a, is that pretty typical for a husband and wife to move into a community and, and both be in those leadership positions and partners in ministry? I can't speak for the rest of the, the world mm -hmm. because Salvation Army is international, but here in the United States it is um, actually a policy that Salvation Army couples, so if you're married, that both are um, Salvation Army officers. That way when you do move, you know, your spouse moves with you for the same job and everything. And so it just makes it easier. Um, I, w I will say that uh, it is challenging to move if you've ever moved before. So even if you move with your spouse, there's still a lot that goes into it. Um, but it is quite common. And sometimes uh, they'll even split up Salvation Army officers. So like say I would work in Duluth and she might work in Superior. There are, there are occasions where stuff like that does happen. Mm -hmm. And knowing how different this community is from Fergus Falls, even though we're in the same state, I, there's yep. a lot of commonalities. We're certainly, all of our communities are different. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, um, what are the biggest differences that you've noticed thus far and things that you want to kind of start to tackle early on in your role? Well, the first thing I noticed is that I can actually go get coffee here. <laughs> That's the biggest difference. I never realized that from a small to a larger community again. But one of the other things is uh, making sure that there's space for, for youth activities. So like um, I was talking with Life 93 or, or yeah, 93.7 earlier, we were just talking about youth activities, um, making sure that there's stuff for the kids and the families who might need it so they can just drop in and might have some fun or have some planned activities for that so that youth have a, a place to go. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're getting into the season when the Red Kettle Drives are going to start. How important is that to the Salvation Army and to the work that you do in local communities? It's massive. It makes up a huge section of our budget. So with, if we don't have those volunteers, we can't do everything else that we do. Um, we have so many different programs that rely on the funding that comes from Kettles, the Mail Appeal, white um, people dropping in. So during our Christmas season, we raise the majority of our funds. So if someone, someone has a time to volunteer an hour or two, we'd greatly appreciate it. If someone drops in a, a little into the kettle, or even this year we're trying something new. We're trying tap to give. So, you know, when you're at the, going to the gas station, they're like, oh, tap your card and you can pay for it. We're trying that at some of our kettles this year so they can just tap and give. If they say, well, I don't have cash, you got your card or your phone, you can tap and give. All right. That convenience, I imagine, will be great for a lot of people. And it's nice that you're able to start um, talking about that now because yep. holiday season is upon us. It is. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's time for Voices of the Region, a weekly review of stories being covered by area journalists. Our guest this time is Marshall Helmberger, editor and publisher of the Timberjay News in Tower, Minnesota. Merger of three nonprofit arts organizations in Ely is raising the excitement level here as it brings the three groups under the energetic leadership of Ian Law, the relatively new executive director of the Northern Lakes Arts Association. When Ian uh, took the helm as executive director of the NLAA in May of last year, he said he saw opportunity for growth. Now Law he graduated from Ely Memorial High School in 2012, and he went on to become a professionally trained actor, singer, and dancer. And when he returned to Ely to take on his new role, he was eager to prove that investing in the arts only creates a more vibrant community. It's been a whirlwind since, uh, since as NLAA has significantly stepped up its own offerings and has now merged with two organizations, Greenstone Arts and the Ely Area Concert Association. Both of those groups had distinct missions with Greenstone focused on public art, such as many of the murals in Ely, 
and the Concert Association, which had its own concert series. But both organizations had run into problems uh, due to lack of energy as leadership aged. And the COVID pandemic halted the concert series for a couple of years, and the group never really reorganized. But Law, who has jumped into his new role with NLAA with both feet, has been able to tap his years in the professional theater to recruit a variety of troops to come to Ely to perform, and he's planning to build on those initial efforts to make Ely a kind of destination for artists will, who are willing to travel. We're also reporting on a controversial billboard that went up a couple of weeks ago in Cotton along Highway 53 that has put the state's most prominent predator in the crosshairs. The billboard, which is expected to remain up for a few more days at least, makes a controversial claim that the state's estimated 2,800 gray wolves consume a total of 54,000 white-tailed deer fawns a year. It's an astonishing number that has predictably generated plenty of heat on social media from people with widely conflicting claims. Greg Beatty, president of the Sturgeon River chapter of the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association, said he's been surprised at the response. His chapter, which encompasses much of Northern St. Louis County, is the entity that rented the billboard for a month's run. And he said plans are in the works for two additional billboards in the future. The billboard has been mostly panned for making a claim that is pretty hard to substantiate and appears to significantly inflate the number of fawns taken by wolves annually in Minnesota. We spoke with Jared Mazurik. He's the executive director of the state office of the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association. And he said the local chapter has been unable to provide the organization with a peer reviewed source for their claim. And he said it's not endorsed by the statewide organization. While the Deer Hunters Association is fully in support of managing the wolf population, Missouri notes that the organization has long tried to hew closely to science in its policy goals and public communications. And finally, we're also highlighting the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Cook Lions Club which has been a remarkably engaged and effective community service organization at a time when most small towns are struggling to maintain these types of groups. In a town with a population under 500, the Cook Lions have 64 members. Of course, quite a few of them live in neighboring areas like Lake Vermilion or North up to Orr. Regardless, it's a remarkably dedicated group that has taken on a laundry list of projects in the Cook area including the establishment of a flag park, funding of training scholarships for fire and ambulance personnel, as well as college scholarships for area students. They gather and collect medical devices and equipment for the Cook Hospital. They deliver meals on wheels and groceries for the homebound and support a wide range of school activities. They also host many events and fundraisers over the years, many focused on kids that help raise money to support their work. It goes to show what effective leadership can bring to a community service organization like the Cook Lions. Next Friday, Community Action Duluth is holding its Dream Big fundraiser at Bent Paddle Brewing in Duluth's Lincoln Park neighborhood. The fundraiser will help support Community Action's mission of helping people rise out of poverty. Here to tell us more is Classy Dudley, the Executive Director of Community Action Duluth. And welcome. Good Hi. to see you. Thanks for having me. At the end of what's another busy week as always? <laughs> always, <laughs> yes. So we'll Classy, continue them. <laughs> you've been at the helm of Community Action for about a year and a half now. Yeah. What are you finding you really need to focus on right now? Um, well, you know, poverty. It's mm -hmm. an intersection in everything. And so we're mm -hmm. seeing a lot of need for help for workforce programs, for food access, um, health care initiatives, and of course, housing is a big one as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're, we're chipping away at it. <laughs> 
when you notice these needs, what's your way internally of kind of managing what gets tackled first with what resources? What does that look like? Yeah, well, community action agencies actually do a CNA, a community needs assessment. So every three years, we go into the community, we meet people where they're at, and we partner with other organizations to really see what's going to drive us for the next three years. And so this year, you know, or we have a couple more years to do it again, but the last year that we saw, we saw jobs was a huge one. Um, just having money to pay bills and stuff was another huge one, and I'm predicting we'll see on our next couple one housing and more jobs will be a, cu a couple of big hitters this item, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are numerous nonprofits and uh, agencies working to help lift people out of poverty in mm -hmm. Duluth. What is it about um, community action that really makes it unique in terms of the programming that you offer and the work that you're doing. What's, what's the niche? Yeah, I think we've been here for a very, very, very long time and we're really trusted in our community. We have great relationships with our community and we're helping not so much silo the other organizations with the people that we're working with and also the partnerships and collaborations with different organizations. So I would say our focus is really empowering the community mm -hmm. and so building that trust is really important and then empowering them to make their decisions. We also do a holistic approach so when we have somebody coming in the door, say to join a work workforce program, they're not just getting on-the-job workforce experience, they're also getting financial coaching. Or hey, they might need a car, they're getting transportation help. Or maybe it's something that they're getting with their health insurance, not all the information they need. Hey, we provide that too. So we really try the holistic approach when a person enters our door, which is helpful too. Mm -hmm. Well, that's so important too because if people are in a state of need you know the more information they have the mm -hmm. better the more resource and access to you know various organizations like yours partner organizations etc so it's really incredible that you do that good work thank you um, I'm curious for dream big what yeah. is your goal for the evening uh, to raise money <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, all of these programs, they cost money. And so anything that we can bring in to support our staff, our mission, our community, the people we work with, the better. Yeah, this year it was really driven by our staff. Um, we talked about what we liked last year, what we liked in the past, and our staff was really set on doing something different that felt homey and comfortable and more open to the community at large. And so we're switching it up this year with Dream Big, but we're definitely dreaming big. Mm -hmm. So what does the event look like for people? Yeah, well this year we're gonna have um, a combination of things. We're doing a silent auction, a live auction. We'll also have three different bands for entertainment. Um, Renee Passau will be there to host the event as well. And we'll have fun things like a wine wall and other <laughs> surprises. <laughs> Yeah, and of course, we'll have some really good beer. <laughs> <laughs> Expected at the brewery yes. location, I would anticipate. So mm -hmm. That's exciting. So yeah. you're looking for community members from all different backgrounds just to be able to come participate and enjoy themselves and hopefully support your organization. Correct? Absolutely, yes. We found our staff like put together this beautiful collage to actually have people who are coming in collaborate in that. So they come in and they can draw and, and we'll have that actually too. And it'll be like a momentum of this event and hopefully something that we can always look up and be proud of. Mm -hmm. What are some of the, the big dreams that you hope to fund? Uh, eliminating poverty. <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, that's our mission and I'm really passionate about helping my community and I want to see this fundraiser go to exactly that. Our staff has worked tirelessly and effortlessly to really push this initiative forward and they work for our participants like so hard and like no other. So just being able to support them through this fundraiser and the funds that we are going to make out of this is a huge goal for me. Are there any projects or initiatives specifically that are being planned that could really have some transformative effect on Duluth? Yes, so we, um, this, was, this isn't necessarily a part of the fundraiser, but we have gotten <laughs> some really good grants. Um, we ha we're gonna be working on um, lead pipe, removing lead pipe from um, communities that um, have been historically marginalized by lead pipes, especially in the low income. We also have a different grant for outreach, so we always talk about Duluth being in silos, and we're gonna try and break those barriers as well and help as many different organizations collaborate with us. Um, we just got a USDA grant that's going to help um, Essentia be able to ascribe, pre prescribe pre 
us <laughs> prescribe um, produce that we will provide to the community at no cost. So a lot of cool things and really helping in food deserts as well. We're looking for a bigger bus because it's a huge need to um, have a mobile market and hit those areas that aren't as fortunate to be able to go to a grocery store. Mm -hmm. So those are just a few. We have tons more, but um, you know, Mincher also helping people get on their insurance is a big one because uh, we're not going to have re-enrollment like it has been through COVID. So getting the word out with that and um, our tax site as well is going to be huge this year because other free tax clinics have closed around the state. So we're going to see an influx with that. We only have about uh, 10 seconds, but give the details when, where, and how do people uh, sign up? Yeah, October 13th, sign up on our website from 5 to 7 at Bent Paddle. Hope to see everybody there. Bring your wallets. <laughs> 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 That's a great pitch. Thank, thank you. you. Tracy Dudley, yeah. good to see you here. Appreciate it. Appreciate thank you. You. Yeah, thanks. This week, Tycho Arts Midwest visited the University of Wisconsin Superior to give students and community members a taste of what Tycho drumming is all about. Producer Megan McGarvey traveled across the bridge to learn more about Tycho and its future as a performance art. The thing about Tycho is you can talk about it, which we do, but it isn't until you hear and feel it in your body. So that's why we love to take the drums around and help people experience it. It hits the human heart right here and kind of resonates throughout the body. And it's just super uplifting and a way to share energy back and forth. Tycho hooked me in my early 20s. I'd never heard of it before. I didn't know what it was. And Rick Shiomi uh, rolled in one drum and he played 20 seconds worth, and I just thought it was so dynamic. I'd never seen anything like it. I'm like, what is this? You have to show me how to do that. I didn't know you knew how to do that. That's incredible. And so I've been doing it now for over two decades, and it's my passion to share this art with as many people as possible. I'm a Korean adoptee. I was raised in Minot, North Dakota. So I had no exposure to this art form or to the community or even to my own sense of Asian American identity. You know, at that time, it was really hard to find anything in the media that really, really connected with. Uh, and so, you know, seeing myself represented, seeing other people, seeing a community of people gather around this art form, it was very empower empowering and sort of just opened my mind and my life to a whole new era, I guess. I don't think I would know who I am if I hadn't found taiko drumming somehow. And so, you know, being a Korean adoptee, I don't have any sort of direct claim to this art form that has, you know, its roots in Japanese culture, but it's been very much embraced by the Asian American culture in North America, and it kind of um, grew in popularity around the same time as the whole Asian American movement. These drums, there's like the human is the centerpiece along with these huge pieces of art really. They're, they're made from a single tree trunk and many of them are a folk art really that we're playing with and the, the thunder of them is just an incredible, like it's a vehicle, like we could be great but the sound of them is just from another world and it's athletic, it's like dance, it's like it's a music instrument, it's many things all rolled up in one as well as for me it's, it's a grounding into the earth and a connection between the human world, the natural world and the spirit world. So it's a very, very special, many layered, authentic cultural experience. The drums speak to everyone, uh, but it's only been, you know, from the beginning, men on the stage getting a chance to do it or direct it or narrate the, the story. And so women actually have been doing it alongside, um, but in some cases not allowed onto the stage um, or only allowed to dance. Um, so the beautiful thing about this project is we pulled together all of those women from around the world. We pulled 18 people who have been off, you know, in the sidelines or isolated. And we made a huge center stage and created a WHO project just for us. And then had a huge sold out concert with 2,000 seats. And we decided to make a film about it. Finding Her Beat is the first full-length documentary film to feature women and Tycho. We documented several years of a journey in bringing the Avengers style gathering, the world's best women and non-binary Tycho players together for the first time ever in a historic concert. 
three years ago, four years ago, we went into like a shutdown of darkness and everybody had to do some soul searching. And now people are tired of the old way and want to do like all these new buds and new plants and new projects and new people are being seen in ways that we just haven't seen before. So it's an incredibly um, powerful time. And I think people are, super thirsty to see these other stories of people who've been in the margins or have been left out of the story up until now. What's been up with these people? Look at all of the life and the brilliance and the creativity that's been going on in the dark. And you can feel it's just sort of this larger movement for these, not just Asian women, but for anyone who's been marginalized that, you know, if you're not invited to the table, make your own table. You know, it's like we've had enough of waiting for somebody to kind of reach down and pluck us up. We're ready to like just rethink the whole system. And I think that's the energy behind Finding Her Beat. And um, it's an energy of sort of a larger movement that I want to be a part of. Keep up with Almanac North by following us on Facebook and X. Keep an eye on the PBS North website where you will find program updates and news about the station. And if you haven't already, download the PBS video app to watch your favorite PBS programs on demand. Well, Kelsey, it's been great to work with you. Thank you so much for coming in. Yes, thank you for having me. I've had a great time tonight. Awesome, and there's lots of fun stuff going on in the community. Oh, always. Fall, <laughs> so get out and enjoy it. For Kelsey Roseth and the crew at Almanac North, I'm Julie Zenner. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next time.